first yeah. degree. Yeah. Uh, uh, Good, good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'd like to welcome you all tonight. The College of Complexes consists of the following format. First, we have a brief announcements period. We'll have a, a, a interest for items of interest for community and plus the upcoming schedule. Second, we'll have our speaker, Jonathan, who will be speaking about the evils of Reaganism. Then we'll have our uh, our question and answer period, followed by our infamous rebuttal period. We need to be out of here by uh, by 7.45 because the restaurant closes at 8 o'clock. I'd like to welcome every year. I do remind you there's a $3 charge to help defray college expenses. And with that, Charlie, let's get started with the announcements. All right. Welcome, everyone, to meeting number 3,757 of the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. Now, though I am not a campus, I will give an advertisement for our upcoming programs. On March 16th, the Libertarian Party of Illinois and Chicago will be presenting their lineup of candidates for offices in the upcoming primary. So that's the Libertarian Party. On the 23rd, Justin Tucker will be returning with an update. He's got a collection of political illustrations or memes that he's collected from social media, which is an interesting conversation, each of them. So that's the 23rd. On the 30th, uh, Mr. Tobin, uh, Grant Tobin will be talking about, this is a very serious issue, long-term care for people with disabilities or with senior citizens. So March 30th. April, we begin our Earth Month series of speakers. On April the 6th, Andy Anderson will be outlining specific things that you can do to uh, bring it in a halt to climate change. April the 6th. On April the 13th, the Illinois Green Party, of which I am affiliated, will be presenting on their upcoming agenda. Illinois Green Party, everyone there. April the 20th, a young lady who's a candidate for the U.S. Congress uh, in the Green Party will be talking about her campaign and her, her views She's a representative of the Xenials. There's uh, millions of them out there, and they have concerns which they want to be addressed. On April the 27th, Marie Perez will be telling us why we should vote for anyone for president of the United States except Joe Biden. Don't vote for Joe, he says. All right, transitioning into May, we're looking for we're still recruiting someone to speak on labor issues for our annual May Day presentation, May the 4th. It's presently open. On May the 11th, author D. Knight will be returning. He's got our latest edition of a lifetime of activism and all sorts of issues which all of us have been involved in, possibly at one time or another. So a, a review of activist issues over the past several decades. Uh, on May the 18th, uh, we get uh, two speakers, Beyond Nuclear and the Nuclear Energy Information Service has a PowerPoint presentation, two of them, on uh, nuclear energy and transporting and nuclear waste and the dangers inherent to that. Um, that, uh, and then on uh, May the 25th, we're going to have two speakers, Tim and Andy Anderson, will be talking about, please maintain quiet in the room. Please maintain quiet in the room. Thank you. All right, guys. Can you... One full at a time. Please maintain quiet in the restaurant. 
Thank you. And mute yourself online. And on May the 25th, we'll be talking about how the GOP is planning to steal your vote and I get Trump elected president of the United States. So we're going to have a lot of presidential politics during the year. And that leaves, we have five dates open in June. So if you'd like to speak, as always, I must have a title and a written presentation description of the program in order to consider booking. Okay, Tim, that's all. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, since we're back online, uh, are you ready, Jonathan, to uh, speak? Peter? What about uh, announcements? Uh, where you wanted to take an announcement? Go ahead. Like get up. Uh, get up front, and uh, let's go ahead and get, make one. All right. Let me get there. Well, you all you got to yeah. Just you just want to get up there and uh. Stay yeah, I, I, I hope everybody here is aware of uh, Bring Home Chicago, the program of uh, getting $100 million in extra revenue for affordable housing through a change in the real estate transfer tax. Uh, the big money people in real estate got it knocked off the ballot with uh, by a judge a few weeks ago. However, it was appealed and it's back on the ballot. Okay, so we have to be sure not to, not to, we have to be sure to remember to go in and vote for that. Um, I think you all know what it is, but I'll be very, very brief. It's an increase, uh, or actually it's a decrease in the basic real estate transfer tax, not property tax. It is not a property tax. It's a one-time tax when um, uh, a property is sold. And uh, it goes down slightly for for 95% of properties, if any of you are property owners, you'll pay less when you sell. And it goes up somewhat, uh, actually fairly substantially at the high end. So the big, uh, the big money people selling the multi-million dollar properties will, uh, will pay more. That, and that's the whole point of it. It's it's uh, it's designated for for ending homelessness. Okay, and there are a variety of things that, that it could do. There's a few things that they don't want it to do, such as uh, I don't think it supports temporary shelters, but I'm not sure on that. But uh, ending home homelessness. Yes, yes. <laughs> Yes, yes, it, it was uh, voted on by the city council to be on the ballot. It has to be voted on a, on a referendum on the ballot. So on uh, March 19th on election day, it'll be, I, it's the first, uh, there's maybe a couple of other referendums. It'll be the first referendum at the end when you get done with all the, the candidates and the judges and everything. Uh, Ernie, remember, I got yeah, vote yes on that. Thank you. Ernie, I, Ernie, Ernie, yeah. Ernie. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the, currently, the real estate transfer tax, beginning in 2008, has been going entirely to fund public transit. And it sounds like this will result in a decrease in funding for the government of public transit. Well, I, I okay. Uh, that I was not aware of. Would you uh, kindly find that's out? A problem. I agree with you. That's a problem. I, I, so you're going to take money from public transit and do use it for something else. Which is... the announcement period. We okay. can get into this later. Uh, yeah, okay. We'll talk about this later, Charlie. Well, I don't I want, want to talk about it. That's that interesting. I don't like. All right, Jonathan, are you ready? Anybody? Let's welcome Jonathan Barton yeah, for our speaker. Hey, Jonathan. Yeah. Just speak normally, Jonathan. Thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, I appreciate the turnout. Good day, Warm. Uh, I'm very humbled and honored once again to have the opportunity to speak at the House of Brundage, uh, the College of Complexes. And I'd like to thank uh, Tim Bolger and Charlie Paydock for their hard work and sacrifice to making free speech uh, 
possible through this forum in the Chicagoland area. So I'd like to uh, thank them both with a small token of my appreciation once again for what they do, the advocates for freedom of speech. All right. This is this is for Tim and Charlie. Jeez. It's a artwork right. by one of my favorite artists named Mr. Fish. Oh God! Thank you, Jonathan. Woo. Thank you, Jonathan. I'll get one for Charlie too. Oh, I love this. All right. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. I'll get these to you, Charlie. Got a few other pieces. I got to get to you too. All right, Jonathan. Thanks a lot. We do appreciate it. My mom will love another piece of artwork on her wall. She's already getting mad about the other two, but that's fine. Gotta take my sister's bridal picture down for it. <laughs> well, she's now divorced, so. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good evening. I have come here to chew bubblegum and denounce the fallacies of Reaganism, and I'm all out of bubblegum. Productivity used to be tied to pay increases. That is no longer true. American workers are way more productive than they were 30 years ago. We would have have 20 million more workers in the economy if we stayed at the same productivity levels we had in 1980. So now when workers are more productive and generate more revenue per hour works, they generate enormous wealth for the corporations, but they get left out of their fair share of the profits. This is all happening in plain sight, day in and day out. What we need to remember when we hear from people who have made trillions of dollars off of supply side trickle down economics is that they are full of shit. They are constantly defending a rigged economic system that's already been thoroughly debunked and discredited, except nobody seems to have told them or the American news media and certainly not the American public. And the biggest bullshit part of trickle down is that if we give massive amounts of wealth to the people already at the top, then a boatload of jobs will automatically appear. Except we've been giving boatloads of money to the people already at the economic top since 1980 and accelerated that giving since 2000. And we're in the middle of the worst economy in approximately 70 years. That's by uh, Jimmy Dore author, speaker, comedian, host of the Jimmy Dore Show from his book, Your Country is Just Not That Into You. Uh, tonight, we're going to talk about how uh, we have the right and the duty to reject Reaganites of both parties. And uh, yes, those of you who are Beastie Boy fans, you can hear that legendary guitar riff in your head right now after we say that each time this evening. When we witness the security camera footage of a bank robbery taking place, we view both the left and right sides of the individuals who are running out of the building with money in their backpacks. We remember it clearly and we remember witnessing firearms either in their right hand, their left hand, or sometimes both hands. We know that it happened because of two equally responsible sides of the same person. We know that it was planned ahead of time by both the left and right sides of the robber's brain. We know that the wealth redistribution was successful because the robbers held a steering wheel of a motor vehicle or often several motor vehicles with their left and right hands to drive and make their getaway from the bank. And we know that the robbers, if they're good at what they do, most likely have residences, financial interests, 
businesses, contacts, accomplices, and supporters in both politically right-wing and politically left-wing communities where ultimately your and my money ends up. The ruling class is extremely toxic and both parties obediently do its bidding. Tragically, masses of people are not fully aware of the severity of the crisis that is the ongoing subservience of the two-party system to oligarchy. Every year, the parties are more and more alike. Their records, their characters, their affiliations, their philosophies, their goals, their perspectives, and their deeds are rooted in the same narrow-minded understanding of the world and her peoples. And the duopoly's lack of contribution to the betterment of society is openly on display for all of us to witness with each new election. The parties both have gone to the extreme right or to the extinctionist right ever since the end of World War II, starting with the removal of Vice President Henry Wallace and making Harry Truman his replacement. The rapid expansion of United States military bases since the end of World War II and the insanely high cost of maintaining such a powerful global presence ensured that threats to the US and US allies would have to be manufactured so that an artificial enemy would be created in the press to shape public opinion on the support more war just and justify young, mostly poor Americans to be drafted or to enlist and more resources to be spent on the military congressional industrial complex and all others in par partnership with it. Corruption has reached disastrous levels ever since and these those in extraordinary power encouraged the continued feverish acceleration towards the point of no return. The peace movement, the civil rights movement, and other popular people's movement politics movements have had then and continue now the goal of directing taxpayer money into programs of social uplift and away from war and conflict. So both political parties had a decision to make, whether to side with the people for peace, domestic prosperity, and equitable programs designed to fully include working class communities and the economic success, or to side with the lobbyists and the weapons contractors and big business, and in doing so would concoct more fictitious enemies, increase more deaths of both service members and civilians, cause more disabilities to both service members and civilians, reap unprecedented profits for themselves and their cronies, and deceive we the people to believe that we are far less safe than we actually are by fanning the flames of paranoia, jingoism, and xenophobia. To read more about some of these topics, uh, read James Carroll's book, House of War, I highly suggest and also the many books by Chalmers Johnson. Those are two authors that I highly suggest to get more insight into how exactly uh, this has happened. James Carroll and Chalmers Johnson. That fork in the road defines the last 70 years and is precisely why they present their qualifications for public office they seek to hold. They rarely discuss issues of substance, rarely know note the exploitive history of their ideological, political, or economic system, rarely acknowledge the wide range of choices that exist elsewhere that have dramatically improved quality of life, rarely define what an important responsibility and vital role the U.S. has to be a global neighbor and not an overseer, rarely articulate why so many of their policies have produced the opposite results that were promised during their time in office, rarely recount the timeline of past failures by themselves or their close colleagues, rarely explain why wages have failed to increase at the same exact level that work production has increased, 
rarely if ever denounce the massive wealth redistribution that is occurring and rarely seem to be fully aware of what everyday people's life experiences are as a result of the countless obstructions, manipulations, delays, oppression, callousness, cruelty, arrogance, and betrayals that are the very structure of the global dominant system. These are the ideas that have dominated the US political scene in our lifetimes. George H.W. Bush, the 41st president of the empire, is infamously quoted as saying, by God, we've kicked the Vietnam syndrome, referring to the point in history when the ruling class no longer pretended to care about self-determination or peace, diplomacy, or international law, or the will of the people, and were fully aware of the fact that now that the U.S. was the last remaining global superpower, instead of demilitarizing and restructuring to address the challenges of environmental destruction, developing international alliances of cooperation in order to end poverty, provide education for all, job training, health care for all, agricultural development, renewable energy infrastructure, and human services, the government would do what empires always do throughout history. They went insane. They expanded beyond their needs. They criminalized dissent and criminalized journalism. They tortured and or disappeared and or murdered those who get in their way and self-appoint themselves as gods and provide lots and lots of breads and circuses to pacify us peasants. We cannot allow ourselves to be forced into being a bully or an overseer or a brutalizer or a badass state. We must reaffirm every day that we are an equality people, a solidarity people, a democracy people, an enlightened civilized community. No one's reached the highest levels of power who has been willing to end voodoo economics, willing to denounce corporatism, willing to call out the failures of neoliberalism, willing to reverse Reaganism, willing to genuinely enact left policies and fight for left values. That's because both major parties don't oppose moving to the extreme right. They are both right-wing parties. One is an extinctionist right-wing party, and the other is a slightly less extinctionist right-wing party. They both welcome more extreme right-minded people into their ranks. There is no left party in the United States, and we the people must change that. The left needs a left choice. The left needs left candidates. The left needs a left party. Let's finally do what we do best on the big stage, introduce a genuine alternative, work together to enact and celebrate the solutions we have always had in all of our solidarity and expose the right for the fraud we know it is, the all-time quackery of history. Now, imagine this scenario for those of you who are sports fans. I'm a big uh, sports uh, person. So this uh, works for me, and I, I hope it works for many of you. If a football player, oval football, not round, so with pads and a helmet. If a football player dressed in full shoulder pads, knee pads and helmet, walks out onto a soccer field, and begins tackling all the players of both teams to the ground, causing career-ending injuries, the offender would immediately be ejected from the stadium and arrested for battery. We wouldn't be arguing over whether the referee should issue a yellow card or a red card for a one-game suspension, like it was merely frowned upon behavior. No, we would object to it, calling it what it is, something that we absolutely are appalled by and in no uncertain terms, oppose. 
But in US politics, when a similar circumstance happens with an extreme right wing candidate, they're given unlimited airtime in the media. They're victorious in elections. They are rewarded with power and wealth during their careers, both in and out of public office. And they're praised by politicians, historians, and pundits as making our country and world a better place for all. Elections are not an opportunity to remove the bad and add the good. We are not ending something bad if it's only possible by allowing another slightly different brand of bad, but not as bad for at least four more years to have power. We're just allowing one flavor of bad to replace the previous one. So the corruption continues just the same. We have nothing to gain and more to lose by supporting the ruling class and surrounding our liberty away to their cronies. Why give them more power than they already have is the question I asked this evening to everybody. The duopoly has needed to retire for a very long time. For the good of the country and the planet, the global family, it needs to end and go on an overdue vacation. The establishment has completely lost its grasp of reality. That's why they don't know what everyday people need and don't care enough to participate in an open discussion to find out. Press conferences are not discussions with community members. Photo opportunities are not discussions with community members. Campaign rallies are not discussions with community members. Choreographed town hall gatherings with hand-picked individuals who have a history of towing the same corporate line and asking all the questions are not discussions with community members. Party conventions, inaugurations, and State of the Union speeches are not discussions with community members. We need to remove the two dominant parties from the legislature so we can craft functioning democratic elections and improve what can still be improved in our civic engine, our civic vehicle, our civic garage, and our civic path, wherever it may lead. We can only build a democracy if we have multiple choices who represent our vision for a better world. Between, between approximately 125 and 130 million people do not want to support the establishment. If given more choices, it's probably closer to only 5 million people. That means approximately 120 million people want alternatives to the status quo. So combine that 120 million who want and need real choices and who genuinely share our values and goals with the 95 million people who either choose a confidence vote or a third party candidate vote. And we have enough people to oust the two party system from political power. That would be a powerful step forward for us to become a self-governing society. Remember the revealing 2013 interview with President Jimmy Carter when he said, quote, America has no functioning democracy. That's all we need to hear to know how much we must radically change now. We have, as a people have got to find the will to exercise our right to re reject Reaganites of both parties, to refuse knowingly to go directly towards those trap doors they dug to delay our mass mobilization and begin to follow our own path. Otherwise, we will spend all our time and energy digging ourselves out of these predictable consequences of believing their lies and false hope and adopting their lowered expectations. And that's if we are among the lucky ones who didn't fall into the really deep traps and had loved ones, friends, and community to assist us to climb up out of it. Like an ocean, our opportunities to live freely and to live fairly are vast. Our lives are like ships, yachts, boats, flotillas, barges, kayaks, 
canoes, rafts, and surfboards. Our choices to decide which way our lives go are many. We can choose what structure we need for the journey we decide to take, and we don't have to wait for election day to be granted permission by the winners or their donors or their enablers. If we peacefully and democratically begin nationwide assemblies and discuss what we agree is keeping us down is, for example, poverty, mass inequality, corruption, war, treason, crimes against humanity, genocide, and totalitarianism, then we can choose to take necessary action and enact a general strike so that those who have conducted these violations are held accountable and we the people can do the work that needs to be done to avoid disaster and be members of civilization. That's real freedom. The ruling class subservient political parties very existence depends on their ability to eliminate the whole history of goals, needs and demands of people's movements from our memory and their effectiveness to narrow our capacity for justice their efforts to consistently reduce our expectations for those in public office and their ever-growing list of ways to limit our participation in and the support of grassroots organizing. The global dominant system's career work has been a systemic rejection of our goals, needs, and demands. They aim to erase our experiences so that we completely forget the important skills we have learned from the sheroes and heroes of history, and they groom us to fear solidarity that is so crucial to building the very important skills we are learning from each other today. Now is our time to disobey the dream limit. There's a quote by Rosa Luxemburg that I'll paraphrase. Without general elections, without unrestricted freedom of press and freedom of assembly, Without a free struggle of opinion, life dies out in every public institution, becomes a mere prop of life in which only the bureaucracy remains as the active element. Not the leadership of the working people, but only the dictatorship of a handful of politicians. And that's my talk. So we'll open it up to Q&A. Who would like to ask a question? Well, that, that party's already been uh, formed. It's just, uh, it's being obstructed by uh, the bullies of the duopoly who don't want the media to ever cover it. So therefore the people don't ever know about it. So on election day, uh, you can't blame people for not knowing what they don't know. Uh, it's not the voters fault. I'm not here to blame voters for the choices that they make. They're doing the best they can. It's just like when you have a very uh, spider web string budget and you can't get the things you need or want. You can just get the bare essentials to survive. So uh, I'm looking at the top, I'm punching up at the ruling class. I'm not blaming or pointing my finger at my neighbor or my fellow human being on earth. So the, the third parties are there, the candidates qualified to represent the values that we the people do exist. Uh, they're currently being censored out of our consciousness by the media. And again, uh, say what you want about public uh, officials, uh, they get an F minus, the corporate media gets a Z minus because they are completely complicit in this takeover of our capacity to uh, think of what policy can be, of what legislature can be, of what our lives can be if ordinary everyday people, which is the original intent of uh, the Athenian model of democracy, ordinary everyday people, rule of the people, not rule of the oligarchs or rule of the plutocrats or rule of the militarists or rule of the Wall Street bankers, hedge fund managers, uh, you know, investment firm uh, CEOs, et cetera. So we have 
we have the power and the knowledge and the expertise and the skills that we need right now within ourselves. What we have to do is collectively be willing to say no in mass without apology. Okay, are we ready for questions, Jonathan? All right, we're gonna go first with- uh... But Sophia's next. Okay, Sophia, then we'll get the questions online. I think this is the first time in the history of College of Complexes that I attended the first two questions were asked by female members. So I'd like to take uh, absolutely no credit in that, but applaud that moment. All right, Sophia, we also got- They're both capitalist stations. They both would have fired the likes of Ed Schultz or uh, Phil Donahue. So I don't see a good guy or a bad guy in capitalist news organizations. They both are there to make profit. So they will tell you the truth that's true if it makes a profit. Uh, they'll tell you the lie that's it's a lie if it makes profit. All right. So they're not necessarily lying to you all the time, but they are obfuscating the truth that doesn't make profit that is absolutely essential to you and my and all of our community sovereignty. So again, I'm not picking out people's choices of what they view or listen to or read. That's all we have, right? There is nobody coming down from the sky during halftime of the Super Bowl with a supernatural power to tell us what's behind the curtain of power and how much they know exactly what they're doing. And what they're doing in the media is obfuscating the information to the people that, yeah, you wanna hold your nose for this one candidate and tolerate the other candidate, or you wanna hold your nose for that candidate, tolerate that other candidate. Well, meanwhile, you're not aware that there's tons of people in every community that are head and shoulders above those two uh, clowns. So, <laughs> I mean, uh, we all know this. We all know someone who's qualified to be local, uh, state, or federal uh, public official who has shown the leadership skills over decades that represents our values far more than a Ronald Reagan or a Ronald Reagan wannabe of either party. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm going to talk about the biting speech later on, so hold on to that thought. All right, Charlie, you're next. You're online. Go ahead and ask your question. Yes, uh, uh, Jonathan, you began your talk by advocating a reduction in the U.S. military budget. However, at this time, China is amassing an army of over 2 million men adding ships to their navy. It looks like they want to first take over the Pacific Rim and then engage in a war with the United States to take over the West. Are you advocating that we as nation be caught defenseless? Jonathan, okay, go ahead. Um, you know, in the imperious, this is what I think about when I think about that question. I don't know if this answers your question directly, but this is what I think about. The imperialist line is that our, our duty is to the nation because of its ideals and its ability to manifest them. And uh, the people who disagree with that imperialist line would say, uh, we're a powerful, wealthy nation because we have a nation's legislature and military and uh, financial backers who oppress peoples of other nations. So uh, no, I don't want the United States people to be vulnerable to any uh, threat or harm, but at the same time, uh, it should be the Department of Defense, not the Department of Offense or the Department of Madness or the Department of uh, Sociopathy or Psychopathy. I, and. Uh, you know, I'll just go down the list of people who very recently, uh, in light of what's been happening all over the world as far as United States military presence in our lifetimes, 
who agree with us, at least maybe not in elections, but in polls, that uh, peace and diplomacy are very, very possible to achieve. Th those people who support that, at least in polls conducted, are military service members, labor unions and workers, students and teachers and Gee. academics, farmers, agricultural workers, the American Bar Association, the legal community, the disability community, which hardly ever gets any media, but I love it when they speak because they know their stuff because they'd had to go through a million hoops to finally reach some level of uh, stability to voice uh, their values on a uh, national or international stage. Human rights groups, journalists, peace organizers, nonprofits, civil society groups, international solidarity groups, immigrants rights groups, and indigenous communities. So uh, I'll just, just quote a quote by uh, Emma Goldman to uh, reiterate that point, resistance to tyranny is humanity's highest ideal. So uh, amongst that group, which I mentioned, the highest ideal of uh, humanity, according to Emma Goldman, is our own military members who have sworn to defend us, not to be an offensive global bully badass state. That's not what they signed up for. And a lot of them who are conscientious objectors uh, cite that as the reason why they no longer feel the way they did five or 10 or 15 or 20 years ago when they first uh, enlisted because they realized that although they love we the people and their fellow service members, the rich guy at the top who never fights in that war that they find out all of a sudden was for profit and had nothing to do with democracy or justice or human rights uh, is someone that they can no longer say uh, deserves their allegiance. Did that answer your question sort of, Charlie? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. All right, uh, Karina, you're next. You're online. I'm sorry. Hang on. All right. Shout it loudly, please. Yeah. Uh, uh, thanks, Jonathan, for a great talk. Um, my question has to do with uh, you know, the school of class that you mentioned. In 1950, there is seen by most people that the most class and um, so that was an era where a man would uh, have a family with five kids and the wife would stay home <laughs> and, uh, and, and you know one income family so um, my question is do um, you think it's possible to ever get back at that time when the middle class and you alluded to this, you know the GDP and productivity has gone up and up and up for 40 years and wages have not in other words Jonathan can it go back to the 50s and the same type of thing that we had back then um, okay, uh, great question. Here's something that Roosevelt said about that, uh, Franklin Roosevelt. In our day, certain economic truths have become accepted as self-evident. Uh, second Bill of Rights, under which a new basis of security and prosperity can be established for all, regardless of station or race or creed. Among these are the right to a useful and remunerative job, the right to earn enough to provide adequate food and clothing and recreation, the right of every farmer to raise and sell their products at a return, which will give them and their family a decent living, the right of every business person, large and small, to trade in an atmosphere of freedom, freedom from unfair competition and domination by monopolies at home or abroad, the right of every family to a decent home, the right to adequate medical care and the opportunity to achieve and enjoy good health, the right to adequate protection from the economic fears of old age, sickness, accidents, unemployment, and what he's implying there is the earliest stages of 
disability rights, or as is often referred to uh, independent living movement, uh, human rights, the right to a good education. All these rights spell security, and after this war is won, we must be prepared to move forward in the implementation of these rights to new goals of human happiness and well-being. Unless there is security here at home, there cannot be lasting peace in the world. In the book, House of War by James Carroll, he talks about how uh, the military became uh, not just the biceps and uh, the calves to defend us uh, from tyranny of the, the, the fascist threat to the globe that existed during World War II. Uh, sadly, they became our heart and soul. And I have two grandfathers who served in World War II. So yeah, I love military service members and their willingness to put everything on the line to defend the freedoms of we the people. What is at issue is should we make the fact that we have strong biceps and strong calves to defend ourselves so prioritized that we no longer have a mind of our own, a voice of our own, uh, willingness, especially internationally, to have a solidarity with other peoples of our own and only think of, hey, I've got really strong biceps and really strong calves, and uh, as long as my bank account is full, uh, I'll take any drug there is to make those biceps and calves be able to punch and kick anybody because that's all that matters. I don't need to communicate with nobody no more. I don't have to cooperate with nobody no more. I don't have to build bridges with nobody no more and organize in order to improve quality of life so my kids can go to any neighborhood and not have to fear getting uh, kidnapped or hit by a bullet or uh, being uh, subject to uh, the trap doors that young people face on their way to uh, making their lives one that we can all look back and say we've provided a good foundation right. for the future generations. All so right. the military is important, but it's not our be all and end all to what human beings are. And if you like a great website on that, go to World Beyond War. I love what they have to say. Karina, you got your up next. Karina, uh, we have. We had had another um, college um, where a gentleman was advocating for Joe Biden and most of the Q&A period was spent on how to get rid of the duopoly. So how would you do that? The gentleman um, who had given the presentation talked about um, it being a structurally built into our system because of our it being winner take all and tied to the geography. So. Uh, you know, you can have another party, but how is it going to be any more successful than the Libertarians, the Greens, the Forward Party, the No Names Party? Yeah. Um, you know, the long answer is uh, we need to organize for things like removing money from politics, having all candidates included in all debates, free media time for all candidates, ranked choice voting, abolishing the electoral college. I mean, weren't, weren't we all pissed off about that in 2016, 2017, 2018? So now, at least according to a lot of media outlets and a lot of people, we've got somebody who are on our side sharing that anger that the electoral college takes away simple math as being how we determine simple math. Somebody has more votes than another person, at least when I watch the Super Bowl, the trophies given to the team that has higher amount of points. That's football. But in how a government this powerful decides its head of state, the person who has less people supporting them can become head of state. So I don't understand that. And most of us don't. 
A permanent end to all gerrymandering, permanent end to superdelegates, abolishing the Supreme Courts uh, of the United States Citizens United decision, right in addition to the US Constitution for voting to be a civil right, have a no confidence vote ballot option and have civics training, especially young people to explain the value of every generation or two voting no confidence vote because it keeps the people honest who want to be in public office and the people who currently hold public office. Proportional representation, mail-in ballots available for all people with disabilities, all seniors, all retirees, all veterans, all students, all workers. Uh, abolishing the 1996 Telecommunications Act so that we the people decide what's on our media have head of state elections and federal elections in the same exact year, like most other democracies, enact laws which protect the profession of journalism so journalists can do their work without being in constant legal jeopardy and or physical danger, and have a provision on the ballot that we have the right to determine how much of our budget is spent on programs of social uplift and how much will have to be cut from the military budget, the intelligence budget, which is an oxymoron, the prison budget, the bailouts from the baking industry budget, and an end to all sweetheart contracts and slush fund budgets that exist in the legislators' day-to-day -day expenditures. Lower the voting age to age 16. If you can drive a car, I'm pretty sure you can handle voting for a public official. It's not controversial in other democracies. It still is here because people in Washington, D.C., whether they like to admit it or not, are very ageist. All this talk about how ageism is on their minds because Trump and Biden are facing ageism from the bottom All right. up. If I can um, just ask, because I'm not. So would you want to get rid of the Go Electoral on. College or are you wanting to change the Constitution? Because the Electoral College is in our constitution. So would you want a constitutional convention well, you can, or- You can amend things that are in the constitution. It's not written in stone by God. It's not saying for saying. It's a, it's a document that is a work in progress. And you know who says it's a work in progress? Well, we do. We have sovereignty to make this country what it is. It, it didn't say anywhere in the constitution for the end of time for eternity this is the only constitution the people can have, even if 95% of the people uh, decide that it needs to be amended, improved, uh, changed. And, you know, the short answer, that was a long answer. The short answer is we peaceful and democratically mass mobilized. We go to D.C. and we stay. Okay. Uh Questions from the peanut gallery in here. Okay, uh, uh, go ahead, then we'll get to Janice. Go ahead. Okay, Janice. I'm going to have you repeat your question with the microphone, okay? Is it being subjected to our police because we stop changing and improving our constitution in the 1950s? And do we need to get back to improving our constitution, which is the thousand thousand? What they want to do always, and uh, we've been made to think we can't change it anymore. But uh, do you agree the way? Do you agree that the way to fix our cuts to get back to supporting the will of the voters is to organize? Okay, Jonathan, grab the mic. And uh, 
Thanks, Jonathan. Repeat the question, you, please. Could you repeat the question, Jonathan? Okay. You got it. Please stay on. Okay, as far as I understand, the question is, uh, do I believe that organizing is our best tool forward in order to make the country's legislature have the policies that most reflect what we want this world to be and our values to be in public policy? To improve the constitution. So it reflects what we want and not special interests. So it reflects your and my and everyday people's values instead of uh, people who are just in it for themselves. Which the founding fathers wanted us to do. Okay, I understand. I understand. Uh, one. One thing I'll say about this is that there's there's organizing uh, to work within the current system and there's organizing to abolish the current system. One's a defense, one's an offense. So both are absolutely crucial to getting what we need and what we want. Uh, so it just depends on what people's uh, strengths are and what their, their interests are. There is organizing within the system to make the system be honest and do what we know is capable within the system. Now, there are some things that just are not possible within the current system because of the profit motive. Uh, if every single uh, person in the country has health care, a job, and uh, opportunity uh, to live a full life, uh, there's going to be a lot of Wall Street bankers who are out of business. So there's going to be a lot of uh, weapons contractors who are out of business. There's going to be a lot of people who think that, uh, you know, uh, Jeff Bezos should go on space trips whenever he wants, are no longer going to be CEOs. So uh, Thomas Paine is considered by many people to also be one of our founders. And here's something he said to that. Uh, reason obeys itself and ignorance submits to whatever is dictated to it. Uh, the reason that 99% of we the people are tearing our hair out every day, trying desperately to get public officials to listen to us, either when we advocate uh, what we want to them by uh, going to them directly or voting is uh, that the Constitution is one early vision of what America can be. Rich, white, male, slave owners idea of what their definition of democracy is. So, you know, it's like a muscle. You have to develop it over time through mass organizing peacefully and democratically. So you can invite your kids and your grandkids and your parents and your grandparents to participate in it. So you get the widest possible uh, dialogue possible. What are our values? And we never have that discussion every year. And that's part of the problem. Uh, if we started having real conventions where we don't know who the candidate is, we actually have a dialogue amongst what is it, 221 approximate million people? Uh, 220 uh, are eligible to vote every election. Uh, imagine how much fun that would be for those of us who love social studies. So I hope that answers your question. I'm uh, not only in favor of organizing, both organizing. The organizing that the powers to be within the system are an approval and thumbs up of and the organizing that they're scared to death of because crazy people like me would be in Washington, D.C. suggesting that we immediately stat join the International Criminal Court because genocide is sort of a thing that I don't want to be known to my future generations as condoning. 
back off a little bit from the mic with, with the story. All right, Janice, you're next. Pitch, what's your question? Unmute, please. And if you can show yourself, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, I uh, was uh, waiting for a long time to get into the meeting, so I don't know the name of the speaker. It's Jonathan Barton. It was my fault for not letting me in because I was away from the system for a few minutes. Okay, thank you. My question is, um, how can we work in the system when money speaks louder than us? How do, you, how do you address that, Jonathan? What was the question again? How much, when money speaks louder than us, how do we address that problem when money speaks louder than us? Do you, do you mean that money has more influence right now or money literally does speak? Because that's what they're conditioning Both. us to believe, <laughs> that it has a heartbeat and it has personhood. And I'm yeah. sure you and I will agree we reject that notion. But the yeah, Supreme money Court talks. doesn't. Money talks, bullshit so, walks. So as I understand it, you're saying metaphorically money speaks. No, in reality. Okay, so would you say that a dollar bill is something that you've ever had a conversation with about a topic? Can you, <laughs> yes. can you take a dollar bill out of your pocket and get its opinion on the State of the Union address the other day by <laughs> President Biden? And I'll we all know right that now. you could not I, attend the I event with the the uh, Union Biden in Chicago unless you had like three hundred thousand dollars yeah okay understood uh well there's approximately 340 million people in the united states and approximately eight billion people on earth so what i'm talking about is movement politics is our number one tool uh not donating not voting not supporting candidates in order to have the change that we envision uh, reflecting a true civilization. Money does talk, but money can and must by we the people be abolished as determining how people's quality of life is. And how do so we do my, that? That's my answer to that. How do we do, how do, that, we do that? Well, you can mobilize. Uh, one of the scariest moments in the history of this country that the corporate media never reports is the Million Man March. A bunch of people, peacefully and democratically, showed up to D.C. expressing their disapproval with the federal government. And from reports of people who were there uh, at that time, one of them on record is a great person to hear the interviews of about this specific topic. Her name is Cynthia McKinney. Uh, she's no longer in office, but she was in office, so she knows uh, what these uh, people behind closed doors talk about and think is reality. Uh, when you get a lot of people peacefully and democratically assembling, which is what the Athenian uh, model of democracy originally envisioned being a consistent part uh, you get public officials who are interested in your and my quality of life being in office and grandstanding millionaires no longer interested in going public office because they realize there's too many checks and balances to keep them walking the straight and narrow. All right. Uh, who's got a question yes in the audience? If not, I'm going to- Still no on. answer from this guy. All right. Jake, you're, you're, uh, you're on. You're muted, Jake. You're next. If you want to unmute him. Answer the question. You're next. The guy on the phone, Jake. Jake, are you there? Go ahead. Hi. Uh, just okay. This is this is not a question. It's a suggestion. Um, we 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 need to abolish the uh, electoral college and replace it with the college of complexes, and we'd be much better off. Yeah, but we got to also have a few issues of governance with us too. We got to take care of over the next few years. Just more, more, more things. All right, uh, Charlie. Jake, thank you for your suggestion. I love that. 
All right, Charlie, you're next. Go ahead. Yes, uh, Jonathan. Jonathan, you began by advocating you want to increase the uh, funding for education, yet I believe the single largest expenditure for any public activity in the United States already is education. Yet in comparison to other countries, our students do very poorly. Johnny can't read. Isn't this money just going into the pocket of the Chicago Teachers Union? Uh, do you want the federal government? I'll take my chances with the Chicago teacher any day compared to somebody from General Dynamics or Raytheon or Lockheed Martin or Boeing. If that's my two choices, I'll take my chances of the Chicago teacher with an engaged citizenry of 340 million Americans uh, any day. But to your point, that's not to uh, allow people to absolve themselves from responsibility just because they work in a profession that uh, we the people would like to have see more power. There are honest members of unions and honest members of labor, and then there's once in a while an outlier who uh, doesn't represent the membership's uh, values. That's all about participation of the membership in order to ensure uh, accountability. So if you have an engaged citizenry, I don't see accountability as being a problem. I think it'll be one of the most refreshing additions to the American scene, uh, uh, occupationally, organizationally, politically, and just in general, humanly. Jonathan, I got a question, if you don't mind. Oh. Um, a lot of this stuff you're talking about is all good in theory and pie in the sky. Yes. Yeah. How are you going to accomplish any of these? Remember that famous pie in the sky, this person who most people say they're uh, affiliated of some faith organization of following, that crazy dreamer guy. Peace. It's pie. That's a lot of pie. Go ahead. You didn't answer my question. Are there any specific actions that you can take to help further democratize the uh, United States? And are we so horrible? Well, what do you mean by we? I'm pretty out there in, uh, you know, clearly saying that uh, the majority of we the people have all the skills necessary to uh, run this country. It's a car, you can grab the steering wheel and drive it somewhere other than off the cliff. Uh, that's indisputable. So uh, I'm not blaming voters or community members or families or workers or ordinary everyday retirees or veterans or people in the neighborhood on the block. Uh, we are the envy of the world for our capacity to be engaged in radical democracy. Uh, there's a sleeping giant in this country that we all know uh, this might be the year because both these candidates might not be the candidates in November. Let's just be honest. There's a lot of good reasons legally and uh, in regards to health concerns, which, you know, I don't fault anybody for having health concerns of seeking higher office. I'm just saying uh, it's not a, there's only two people in the whole country of 340 million people who can be in government, especially at the highest levels of government. So uh, that's why I love the potential for us to start to wake up the sleeping giant and be engaged in a way that my social studies teacher in high school, uh, Sandra Pierce, said uh, the civil rights movement will look like a preseason game once that happens. I mean, can you imagine with social media what we can accomplish with assemblies all over the country? Occupy was on the one yard line. All we needed was just a little bit more participation from everyday ordinary families and the media to actually report it accurately. This is a movement like the civil rights movement. 
These aren't dirty people who don't have jobs, who don't want to work. I, I would hand out flyers outside the Chicago Board of Trade, and people would come out of the Chicago Board of Trade and try every scoundrelish, if that's a word, tactic in the book to try to push our buttons verbally to get us to lose our composure. Or they would take a flyer from me, look at it for two seconds, crumble it up, throw it in the garbage can to try to get your goat, and tell us, why don't you want to work? Why don't you get a job? And I was like, well, I have two jobs. I'm a home service provider for people with disabilities. And then for free, I volunteer to provide care for my mom, who's a retired nurse who has multiple sclerosis and is in a wheelchair. And uh, I don't have a day off. I'm here right now because other people from her local faith organization and or neighbors can provide care for her. And the person I provide care for through the miracle of America has a job right now and goes to a local place where they work. And uh, the Chicago Board of Trade members, uh, you know, that's sort of the argument. Uh, you're destroying our ability to make profits to be all and end all of human life. And you just want too much democracy. Well, they've always said that throughout history when good things have happened. You want too much democracy for women. You want too much democracy for peaceniks. You want too much democracy for people with disabilities or workers, or you want too much democracy for agricultural workers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Those people who say we want too much democracy, it's like saying you want too much oxygen, gravity, and sunlight at the end of the day. It's just kind of a bizarre argument to make, but we're in a free country, so everybody who the next time the movement uh, goes mainstream and you see assemblies all throughout the country, you still have the right to make it because we believe in freedom of speech and I'm a good Slim Brundage student, so I'll respect the opposition side to our viewpoint. All right. Uh, all right, we got... We'll and defend the their way. right to say it. All right, now loud, please. Go ahead and answer your question. When it comes to our uh, constitutional amendment, there's nothing stopping you. You have a clear process, you must follow. And if you can get the vote, you can, you can pass it. That's correct. Uh, we need to break apathy. And one way you break apathy is uh, you just... Uh, you become vigilant. Now I know it's easy to say from podium on Zoom, become vigilant, and uh, that's a bumper sticker then for me. Uh, I'm asking all of you to find your ways of expressing your formula to become vigilant. I'm not the average person. At 11 years old, I was uh, able, because my dad was a physicist and he worked for the Department of Energy, to live in Europe and learn the history of fascism in a country that uh, was promoting fascism in the 1930s and 1940s through real terrorism against its own domestic population and uh, learning how that history throughout the world uh, creates people who live in former fascist dictatorships to have, uh, you know, this is just one of my personal experiences from that generation, not my classmates, but the older generation, they had a facial uh, expression, a countenance of one of crisis of identity and what is our legacy to the world right now, because decades after the end of World War II, we're thank God the fascists at least of Europe lost. There's a lot of fascists in America who uh, made a lot of profit off it and didn't lose. Uh, they were feeling like, why did this happen? And it happens because of something very natural to human beings, and you can't fault human beings for feeling something that is powerful, fear. So when you're in a resistance movement, like the resistance to fascism, it was known as the White Rose Movement in Germany, uh, you just have to practice saying no to the bully in the schoolyard, even though the bully is gonna break your nose and steal your lunch money and take your shoes and kick you in the teeth and make fun of you and make it hard as hell for you to enjoy lunch. 
because if you maintain your dignity and continue to say no, eventually all the other kids in the uh, schoolyard and in the lunchroom and in the classroom in the school are going to join uh, the people who are being bullied by the bully and not the bully. Why? Because that's our natural state as human beings. Our natural state of human beings is not to hurt each other and be superior. It's to be a circle, not a ladder. So when people exercise in mass their dignified, peaceful, democratic acknowledgement of who our, our, what our natural state is, we become a big circle where no one wants to be in the center of the circle. What's in the center of the circle are our visions for a better world. As you uh, sometimes hear me often say at the College of Complexes, the only thing that's at the center of the circle then when we truly have a peaceful, democratic, uh, we the people society are the we ideas. And uh, what I'm rejecting in Reaganism is the big ideas and what I'm uh, uh, advocating for are we the people of Earth's we ideas. Because those guys in Washington, they got a lot of ideas right now. They don't have any we ideas. It's time for we the people on the big stage to present the we ideas because that's what's going to get us out of this mess that uh, you, you hear people on television saying uh, it's not a genocide, it's a war. You know, I just flatly reject that and am disgusted as someone who firsthand, I didn't have to read it in a history book. I was there 40 years after World War II where it happened, and you could just see on the people's facial features, they were ashamed. Do we want to be that nation where there's Americans 10 or 20 or 30 years from now being ashamed of condoning uh, genocide? or blowing up a pipeline off the coastline of our own ally? Do we, do we want to be that? I don't think so. All right, you've got a question. Um, go ahead. All right, well, loud, loud, please. Hold on. Jonathan's going to give you the mic. No, no it's, it's, it's not that. It's just they want to hear yeah. you on the computer. I put on the news that people who are handicapped don't have to be paid minimum wage in this state. Is that true? There are some laws about whether they should have to pay minimum wage to folks who are handicapped? Is that true? I think the minimum wage law is... All right, hang on, hang on. Jonathan is... Uh, law for all uh, Illinoisans. But there are ways around it because oh, we got three questions. So yeah. Second one, please. But there are ways around it. Jonathan, let her answer. There's so much structural discrimination. I'll come up there. All right, there. come on up there. Yeah, like, like, like they okay. said, it would be a lot we easier. Can get the mic then. Okay, and then the other thing is more of a statement. I think the Electoral College gave us uh, a dictator for president. Yeah, correct. Because correct. we could have had our first woman president yeah, without the Electoral dictator. College. We got to get rid of it, huh? Yeah. Get out of first woman dictator. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. But I think that's kind of the job description. Yeah. yeah. The you other know, thing. If you're yeah. good at dictating dictatorship. Here's as a dictator. Well, then, you know, who's the biggest dick. I mean, that's the problem with the way civics is in countries like America. You know, we've we've got dictatorships. A little, lot, a little further from your mouth. We've got dictatorships being normalized, which of course is not normal. Right. Okay. And then, uh, then the other thing you say is that it's human nature to want to. I don't think that's true. You know, there's that lust for power and money. It's like drinking salt water. Yes. And once you get into that, you can't get enough power. You can't get enough money. And you're going to keep peeking after it, putting everything else aside, which is what's happening in our government. Yes. yes. Okay. Because money plays such a big role in getting the, getting the job and keeping it. Okay. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, it is exhausting to have a, a democratic system that has checks and balances. Right, Jonathan, a little farther away. Put the microphone on the podium. Put it back on the podium, Jonathan. It, it's true. It's exhausting to have checks and balances in a democracy that prevents this corruption that I'm denouncing. It's not easy, uh, but neither is uh, 
you know, developing the technology that we now have that uh, Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass and uh, Harriet Tubman and uh, Emily Dickinson could have never dreamed of, you know. Uh, advancement on earth is possible within all different areas. If it's possible to have technology that in the inception of the country, and I don't mean the 1770s, I, I mean when people lived here before then already who were indigenous community, the Native American community, uh, you know, they had technology that hundreds of years before that was unthinkable by those community members. So we're always advancing in every area, but we can't abolish the electoral college that says that math can't be math when we need math to be math. No wonder we've lost our way. You know, and I think one of the candidates, it's a third party candidate, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. said, uh, that's why he's running because we've lost our way, not we the people, uh, the way the powers that be rig the system. It's a shell game and they all know it and they know it's only a matter of time before the sleeping giant wakes up. What they want, and they say this behind closed doors all the time, they want us to be the most uncivilized example of the sleeping giant waking up. You know, mad, crazy, wild, violent people running through the streets like frothing at the mouth, Doberman pinchers or pit bulls, instead of social studies fans peacefully and democratically bringing our kids and our grandkids and our parents and our grandparents having uh, general assemblies where we uh, recount the writings of Howard Zinn or uh, we invite speakers like Shama Sawant or we invite speakers like Alice Walker or we invite uh, speakers uh, like uh, Chokley Lumumba, the uh, mayor from Jackson, Mississippi. You we know, also need Martin, Fried Martin Friedman, too. I don't know who that is, but God bless Milton him, and he's Friedman. welcome into the, the dialogue because everybody's voice counts because we are a circle and not a ladder. So I, I, don't, I don't demonize people because I disagree with their policy. I still want them to have the best possible life possible through my cooperation mm -hmm. and making sure that there's a list of minimum essentials that we all have. We can disagree on what direction to get to radically uh, empowering democracy, but the fact that we all agree that we need to get to democracy and away from the other isms, fascism, extinctionism, communism, whatever other... Uh, oligarchyism, uh, you know, the number one reason why they want us to think that January 6th is uh, uh, something that's so serious to them behind closed doors isn't that they uh, feel that, uh, you know, that's something that they don't want to happen in other forms because they're conducting January 6th every day economically. They're conducting January 6th every day environmentally. They're conducting January 6th every day electorally. So the, for the first uh, question any journalist should ask, if you don't want to have a crowd of people who know what's going on falling out of their chairs laughing, is, uh, okay, you're opposed to something that's the opposite of democracy in the form of whether people should peacefully or violently uh, uh, show up to the Capitol when they disagree with an outcome of an election for head of state. Okay, well, put your, put your actions where your words are. How about all these other examples of that that you in D.C., the lobbyists, the CEOs, the weapons contractors, the people on the bribes, uh, knowingly conduct every single day as business as usual that makes ordinary everyday people have to work three jobs just to survive. Uh, the people are saying we know they're asking for it and we're not gonna fall in their trap to, to, to say, well, let's all 
uh, arm up with the biggest weapon we can carry. No, I'm going to arm up with books, and I'm going to arm up with brothers and sisters from organizing groups, and I'm going to arm up with my dreams and visions of a better America and call them on their bluff and watch the checkmate happen once that happens. Okay. We're angry, and we have reason to be angry, and we're going to exercise it in a dignified way. We're going to get Charlie next, and we're going to get you. Charlie, go ahead. All right. All right. Uh, Charlie said, according to Reaganomics, Reagan, Reagan said, uh, do not tax the 10% rich people, the CEOs. And they're going to take that money instead and invest it in companies, the economy, which Tim likes. They're going to invest in capitalism, and they'll be job creators. And don't you want poor people to have jobs? I couldn't have said it better myself, Charlie. It takes yeah, capitalism to make jobs. Job. All right, Jonathan, answer the question. Well, that's an interesting juxtaposition of tonight's topic. Uh, if you ask the average state person on the street, uh, is the most pressing issue on your mind, do you want human beings to have justice, or do you want poor people to have jobs? Well, it doesn't have to be an either or. I want human beings all over the earth to have justice, and I want poor people to have a high quality of life. But what is the definition of job? If your definition of job is only what fits into oligarchy, only what fits into plutocracy, only what fits in with the narrow uh, parameters of militarism and surveillanceism and ecocide and corporatism, well, what kind of job is that? That's a job uh, like uh, having chains on you in a plantation is a job. That's not really a job that is uh, a job according to how ordinary people view uh, a living existence job. That's a surviving because somebody called it a job. They call manufacturing jobs under the last administration making hamburgers. I mean, is that manufacturing something? I don't know. I, I'd like to think that that's an important thing that I value and want those uh, fellow brothers and sisters in my community to make a living wage, but I wouldn't call that manufacturing. They're putting food together so people can have something to eat. That's manufacturing. Okay, so that is a job, but it's a service. It's a service employment. It's not building something. You're assembling food accumulating things to make a sandwich, which every time I go to get a sandwich, I say thank you and appreciate it from the workers who do that. But for the government to try to inflate numbers to say, look how manufacturing jobs have increased over my tenure is really disingenuous. They, they didn't create more manufacturing jobs. They just labeled anything they want like they do. Definitions no longer apply to words. They could just Words mean anything they want it to mean at any given moment. They're nebulous things all of a sudden, words and definitions, uh, just to suit their uh, short-term economic, political, and otherwise uh, demagogic, uh, egomaniac uh, aims. Okay, Jonathan, we're going to ask you to just shorten your words. And that's what we're going to go. All right, uh, you want to come up? Lee, uh, I'm going to ask that the mic be passed to you back here, uh, just so that they can hear on the computer. We can hear you fine in the thing. But uh, let me get you, Lee. That's all right. Go ahead. <laughs> We're going to have to wake up because if you read the book 1984, mm -hmm. in there, our basic uh, citizenry is totally silent. No control over the The power of the people on the stuff. You know, they have no cares about anybody in there. Well, we have done oh, part. We're going to have a rebuttal period if you've got a question. That's a question. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll get you. We'll oh. get you. We'll, if you have a question, that's fine. We'll get your rebuttal in a, we'll get your rebuttal in a, in a few minutes. All right. Next, we're going to eat you next. Uh, I'm sorry about all the trouble here. Go ahead. 
So democracy is clearly something that matters to the left, Jonathan, and you talked about abolishing the electoral college. I can also assume you probably have a fan of the Senate. Um, but the reason why we have an electoral college is to help in checks and balances and authoritarian measures is because uh, Republicans are things that uh, we need to protect individual differences to other is bad for or that the democracy is dangerous or Okay, Jonathan, did you get this question? You know, if I, if I had my dream administration to knock the duopoly out of power for one generation, it would be a combination of either uh, Shama Sawan as the number one go-to person, for example, Ron Paul, second person in genuine partnership to develop that new anti-duopoly anti-militarism, anti-business as usual, Washington, D.C. administration, or a Ron Paul, number one, the Shama Sawant, number two. Uh, I'm not demonizing honest uh, conservative perspective because uh, honest conservatives in other parts of the world where the conservative parties unanimously uh, support universal health care for all, for example, in other countries, are very different than what's conservative here. We've gone so extreme right that uh, what, you, what you basically have is in this country politically, you have both parties going so extreme right that one has gone right to extinctionism, sprinting over the cliff and celebrating sprinting over the cliff. And another one saying, walk over the cliff, but also celebrate it. So conservatism is betrayed by the people who call themselves conservatives by that definition. The conservatives in this country who genuinely uh, embrace a global dignified definition of conservatism and liberalism is betrayed by a lot of politicians and big money donors in this country who consider themselves liberalism. But when it comes time to, uh, you know, for example, Julian Assange to, to free him for just conducting journalism, both parties are saying, we don't want journalism. So, I mean, there's your red flag right there. Citizens United, another red flag. Has either party's presidents uh, since C Citizens United used the bully pulpit to say, well, of course, a, a dollar bill uh, doesn't have, uh, you know, a personhood. It can't speak. It doesn't have a heartbeat. You know, there, there are simple things you can go to, touchstone moments where you see both parties are asking for it, for the sleeping giant to peacefully and democratically wake up and allow Americans to know their neighbors again, whether they're left, right, or independent, and say, we're not going to be pitted against each other and divided and conquered. We're looking at the top who don't care about red, blue, purple, or green, or gold. We're looking at the top of the people who are in the ruling class that uh, their favorite hue is the country club is going to get more for the godsidents and the peasants are going to continue to be the peasants. So that's the uh, juxtaposition of those two opposing viewpoints that uh, I'm thinking about when I think about democracy and the definition of ordinary everyday people's dinner table uh, word democracy okay. and not people in Washington, D.C. who just use that to... Uh, Fill their bank accounts with more money. Okay, Ellen. Um, I think Clark Clark's next, no, and then no, Ellen. We're gonna, Ellen hasn't had a question yet. Well, yeah, I had one already, that's all right. We're in but let's let, let Clark go, and then Ellen. Okay, Clark, Clark, go ahead. No, we'll, we'll just he just needs a computer mic. Oh, I 
Yes. Jonathan answer the question yeah we dream of having uh, equality we dream of having opportunity to use our skills at any uh, professional endeavor that we seek we dream of uh, dignity and camaraderie and human relations based on honesty and uh, diligence and wisdom and humility and uh, long-term commitment to sacrifice for the greater good. That's our human nature. Uh, the, peop the people who know what power is in places like uh, Washington DC and want it for power's sake are, uh, you know, they're vetted for a very important reason. Uh, they're able, I think this is the definition of either psych psychopath or sociopath. They can have two completely uh, polarized opposite viewpoints in their minds simultaneously and uh, still act according to, uh, they are in agreement with ordinary people that those words have the definition that every day, every, they other people have and uh okay. it's just literally uh you know like that character uh the burger okay. meister meister burger when he his whole head spins around he has two faces and it's like uh okay you, you have to learn that over many years of indoctrination in these places of wealth and power and influence where so much isolation is used and Reagan was a big person who used this. You know, he was a reactionary. So he used charm, oversimplification, uh, and s s basically, uh, uh, you know, lack of genuine solidarity to justify his worldview, where uh, the people who had power were the ones who won the game of history, and. Uh, everybody else is kind of the scenery. And I think okay. that's not human nature, but it is the nature of the ruling class. And that's why I say when you have these secretive uh, things that exist in the ruling class, uh, it's going to be toxic to ordinary everyday people's quality of life. So no, it's not human nature to have lust for power. It's human nature to want to empower each other through cooperation to have communities of everybody's voices is heard and ordinary people can run for the highest political office and not just a billionaire after billionaire after billionaire, oligarch after oligarch right. after oligarch, pro-war of aggression supporter after poor war okay. of aggression. Jonathan, we gotta, get, we gotta get Ellen and then we're gonna do Be, Before you ask your question, somebody mentioned Orwell. Here's one of my favorite quotes uh, by George or while political language is designed to make lies sound truthful and murder respectful and to give the appearance of solidity to pure win. All right, Ellen, you want your question? Go ahead. Why don't you go up front next to Jonathan? This way we can hear you. Now go right up, go right up next to him. And uh, Karina, yeah. you're going to go next because then we're going to go to rebuttals. I, go ahead, Ellen. I have so many questions, but the, the main, I guess the two biggest are. Um, one, I just, I think you've got to run for office because I've learned this over time that, um, you know, the best way to figure out the way the game is to be a player in it. And there's, they will try to do everything they can to keep the voice of truth from getting there. And it'll be a model for others. But so if you could speak to that, but also um, I think the hidden threat of our world is revisionist Zionism, the, the way that it is, we're all self-censoring because we're, they call us anti-Semitic if we say, but okay. there's a lot of control in a, 
in a hidden empire and philosophy of kind of fascism that uh, calls itself goodness. Okay. If you could comment on that, that'd be good. All right, Jonathan, go ahead and comment and make it a quick one because I want to get to rebuttals. We're starting to run out of time a little bit. Mm -hmm. Serena, you're next. You know, uh, in, the, in the 1770s, I think the reason one of the ingredients that they had uh, what it took to say no to a corrupt dictator, uh, an overseer, an occupier, a uh, colonialist king on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, the reason why they were able to take collective action and say no is I, I genuinely believe that the majority of those men and women uh, weren't interested in uh, power. I think they were interested in empowerment. So, uh, you know, when, when someone's profession is uh, one where they can organize for empowerment of the community, uh, they know. Okay, Jonathan, let's make this quick. He's I got one more question and we got to go to rebuttals. So uh, I would love to live in a country where uh, nobody, nobody really sees running for office uh, the way we currently see it. We see running for office as um, something where you just have anonymous suggestions from community organizing groups. Uh, who's been in the trenches uh, for decades that we know of that uh, All right. that we we know once they're on the big stage uh, they'll finally get their due so uh, you know I'm like a, a roadie for the Beatles I want to see the Beatles on stage I don't want to see the roadies on stage so I know some people who I've known in my lifetime in Illinois who are the real deal Beatles. Okay. And uh, it's it's very important for me to keep my eyes on the prize of knowing what that moment would be like. All right, Karina, go ahead, you're online. Karina, you're gonna get the next question. You had your hand up. Um, you and Charlie were talking about employment and what is valid employment, but uh, the major topic of the day really is artificial intelligence and its ability Maybe in the long term, it will create new jobs, but it will also uh, pretty soon start eliminating jobs. And um, so what, what would actually be my question um, is, well, this is, I, I'm inarticulate, but how would you deal with, with job loss from artificial intelligence? Or other technologies, job losses. I, the labor community has suggested that some of the greatest jobs that the system, for whatever reason, uh, you know, come to your own conclusion, uh, refuses to prioritize is like high speed rail, home service providers, more broadband, more infrastructure. What kind of communities benefit from that prioritization in the United States of America in 2024 with the budget that we have? Working class communities. So, you know, they, they want to be job creators, but they want to be job creators where the people who get those jobs are good, obedient, pro oligarchy, pro plutocrat, uh, you know, folks. You know, they don't like people from working class communities that their whole life they know that they've been lied to suddenly getting an infrastructure or a high speed rail or a home service provider job with the living wage or providing broadband for the community or more nurses. Uh, they don't want that. Okay, Jonathan. Here's a quote that I don't know speaks to that, but uh, nonetheless, I really like this quote. We must learn that passively to accept an unjust system is to cooperate with that system and thereby to become a participant in its evil. That's a quote by Martin Luther King Jr. Okay, Jonathan. Let's thank Jonathan for speaking tonight. Yeah.
And uh, we appreciate you coming up, Jonathan. All right. <clears throat> now is our infamous time for rebuttals. And uh, whether you be online or here, I know there's a lot of people kind of itching at the trigger to speak. Tonight, we're going to use the rebuttal platform here because, you know, we can hear you guys. We can hear the speaker. If you're disabled or you can't make it up, you just let me know. We'll bring the mic and the camera to you. But otherwise, I'll limit rebuttals to about three to four minutes. Who uh, who wants to rebut out here? Okay. Um, I'm not going to specify the link, but I know there's a few online. I'll alternate between online and uh, here. Sid, well, I'll bring you back. Why don't you come on up first and go ahead and give you three or four minutes. And then we'll, uh, Sid, you can just stay right there. I'll bring the camera to you later on. Uh, Lee, go ahead. You can start, get started. You got about three to four minutes, Lee. And we appreciate everybody else. And uh, just, uh, we can always form a line over here. Jonathan, I'll get the last three. Got about 40, 40 minutes or so to finish everything. Okay, Lee, you got three or four minutes. And we'll move on to the next person. Okay, started before mentioning we're in 1984 land. I'm sorry, but it's true. Um, anything that you've tried to get changed in America doesn't happen, no matter how many pro, uh, what do we call it, petitions or uh, protests or marches, nothing's going to help. And you probably noticed that if you've been trying. Okay, we have a gun problem. There are over a hundred anti-gun violence groups in this country. Every one of them has dozens, if not hundreds of members and they have monthly meetings and they quote, do things to stop gun violence. Nothing's happened, right? And the reason is they're aiming at the wrong thing. What we have, I'm sorry, that's, oh yeah, I'm sorry. That was clever, but I didn't realize it. <laughs> I'm not that good. <laughs> I'm sorry. But the thing is, um, if you took science in college, they told you that any problem, you look for the root cause. If you, if you instead look at the symptoms, nothing's going to happen. The root cause will continue to give the problem. So find the root cause. Now, what's the root cause of gun violence in America? Well, there is one root cause that is easy to identify. Because every other nation that had one mass shooting, in, uh, their government immediately brought in gun restriction laws they had mass buybacks of, of uh, military weapons. Next thing you know, every one of those other nations had no more mass shootings for 20 years. None. But America does have 600 or 460 every year. And why? No gun restrictions. Now, where is the root cause of that? The Republican Party. No, not Bush. The Republican Party, they are a people that don't have any policies that voters will support. So what they have to do is find somebody that will get votes for them that has no interest in the people. What they found was that the, Repu that the NRA suddenly changed its policy from marksmanship and gun safety to end gun restrictions in America. In the mid 70s, they were basically taken over by what I would guess would be people sent to their annual convention from the Gun Manufacturers Association. All right, so that was what started it. And then the National Sports Shooting Federation, which is a big gun lobby, a gun manufacturers lobby, joined in. So those are two powerful political organizations that can get a lot of people to vote in their direction. And they are the ones that the Republican Party is supporting by killing gun restrictions. Now, if you know that every gun restriction uh, that's passed in other countries has stopped all the mass shootings, 
then you also know that every Republican who is saying, well, I don't think we can pass gun restrictions or well, what the Second Amendment. Uh-uh. He's responsible for the people because he's got a government position. And his job is to pass laws that will protect and promote the general welfare, if you want to get on this preamble. But the point is, that's his job. But if he says no gun restrictions, he is violating his oath, which was to promote the general welfare. And as a result, he should be in jail. There's a very simple law called conspiracy to defraud the United States. If you do anything that impairs, obstructs, or stops the proper function of any government agency, you're in jail for seven years. Every one of those Republicans who says no gun restrictions because the Second Amendment should be in jail. And that would be the root cause solution to gun violence. Now, as soon as we put those ba- uh, those fellows, gentlemen, in jail, we have a great problem. Every person who lost his father, his son, his aunt to gun violence now comes to the personal injury lawyer and says, wrongful death, I'll take a million, maybe two million from those Republican senators because they have caused the wrongful death of every one of the people that died from gun violence. I rest my case. Okay. Anybody uh, want to complain? <laughs> all right, Charlie, I'm going to let you go next. Charlie, go next. All right. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Jonathan for another uh, scintillating uh, presentation. Very well done, my friend. Uh, I would like to answer the question of the uh, that was posed, are disabled people excluded from the minimum wage law? No, they are not. Now, there are two laws that govern. I've handled many cases like this, and even then I don't profess to be an expert. But there are two laws passed. In 1938, the Fair Labor Standard Act uh, was passed making the federal minimum wage the law of the land everywhere. The law came in 1980, the American with Disabilities Act, which covered some other aspects as well. You might also throw in uh, 1968, the Equal Employment EEO Act has provisions of it. So you have a little bit of a conflict here. Now, as it turns out, Under the Fair Labor Standards Act, certain groups of employees were excluded, specifically agricultural workers and domestic employees. This was done to accommodate and get the votes of Southerners at the time. They still are excluded. Um, Now, as it turns out, the fair... The minimum wage law, again, applies to all employees it, and except an employer may petition or apply to the Department of Labor that they have a situation that uh, does not require them to pay minimum wage. So you have to apply Let's say you have a training program, and I'm only guessing, let's say you could hire 10 disabled people or 10 regular people. It involves an area called reasonable accommodation. Is the employer providing reasonable accommodation, which is an expense to the employer? And what reasonable accommodation is, is an expensive topic. Um, is it a capital R reasonable or is it a small R? There's all kinds of cases I've handled like this, but normally, in answer again, disabled or handicapped, you get you get the minimum wage no. unless the employer can apply 
and say there are circumstances such as a training program for a limited period of time or whatever. That's all I could ascertain. I didn't know to what extent employers, if any, have applied for a, for a uh, dispensation from that requirement or all the details of it. Or if anybody, if anybody's ever been granted it, but in answer to your question, no, disabled and, and handicapped colleagues are all paid the same. Unless the employer can convince the Department of Labor that there are special circumstances. And we don't even, it doesn't look like it's a permanent condition either. All right, and last thing is, you you really don't like, my Jonathan, you don't like ergonomics. Then how come these people, every now and then I see that they want to carve Ronald Reagan's likeness onto Mount Rushmore. And they think he was a pretty good guy. Uh, so anyhow, okay, thank you very much. You gave us something to think about. Reaganomics is certainly very much alive within the Republican Party uh, as a measure has many features, trickle down, which is absolute nonsense, ridiculous. Well, it does not trickle down. You have to take from the rich and give to the poor directly and deliberately if it's ever going to happen. Okay. And trying to perfect capitalism, as Tim would have you think, just a little, that's what unions try to do. They're a counter to capitalism. And Okay. And the this is just some sort of goofy arguments that capitalism works. When in fact, I've talked many, many times, capitalism does not work. It's ridiculous to say businesses close, people go unemployed, people don't make enough money to live on, a living wage, all sorts of things. But it's some sort of crazy notion crazy. that capitalism works if you accept that then you accept economics thank okay. you very much all right sid you're next go ahead the trouble is that people are pretty much misled we call our country democratic but if you look at the best definition of democratic it's given by abraham lincoln he says, of, by, and for the people. What we have in the United States is of, by, and for millionaires and billionaires. That's what we have in the United States. Uh, it's not how hard for us that makes you money. It's how hard you got other people working for you. It makes you a millionaire and a billionaire. Elon Musk is a billionaire, a multi-billionaire. How do he make his money? I have other people working hard for him and not for themselves. A lot of these people that have money are what you call rentiers. What they do, they have coupons and they have investments in the stock and they might live in a high rise that is air conditioned in the summertime and plenty in the wintertime. In the summer, they might go to Miami Beach and they're working very hard, sitting in their living chair and having coupons come in and make millions for them or billions for them. Most of them never done a hard work in their own life. They inherited a lot of their money. I remember there used to be a place 
on Clark Street. This was a long time ago, called the Social Science Forum. One day, who shows up there? One of the rock stars goes up there and somebody says to him, Mr. Rockefeller, when are you going to get off people's backs? Realize that everybody in there would laugh if he didn't tell the truth. So he told the truth. We're going to stay there as long as we can. And they make wars constantly because war pays off. When you destroy a tank or destroy an airplane, that's millions of dollars that has to be produced to make another one and another one and another one. But if you have a car that'll last 10 years, you're not going to buy one for 10 years. But the wars, they make so much money. So they want wars. Without wars, they can make the profits that they can, that they do make. And if you take American automobile workers, and now they got a good race, why? Because they struggled for it. But if you look at Mexico, where they do the same work for the same corporations, they make one tenth of what American workers make. That's called imperialism. And we've got places throughout the states, throughout all the states in, in this uh, in this universe, our own universe, the earth. That's the way they make their money, through war and things of that nature. In order to have a decent life, we have to have a system not based on profit, but based on values that people need, good jobs, recreation time, all kinds of activities, and they could run their things themselves. Okay, Sid, we appreciate you talking tonight. I'm gonna to let you get, but get up front, I'll let it be bad. We're gonna have Ellen go next and get up front. And uh, let me get the mic racks mm -hmm. back up here in a minute so we can get her and everything else. Just please give me a second, Ellen, to get everything set for you. Bear with me, please. We shall be ready with Ellen in a second. Testing, testing. All right, good. Okay. Uh, right. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, and thank you, Jonathan. I'm so glad to see you. Uh, we've missed you the last few weeks, and uh, keep coming back. Um, okay. I am going to follow George Orwell's advice to say what they don't want you to say. Everything else is PR. And um, so since I only have three minutes, I thought I'd go through. I, I think one good thing you did tonight was read what you'd already written. And it, I've done about five of these. They're all on the archive of the College of Complexes. And I do think the ones that I've written out have gone the best because uh, there's so many ideas and there's so much evidence about the wrongdoing of this criminal state that um, it just, you know, the question I've been asking the last 10, 20 years uh, is, you know, how do we prosecute them, right? And it's basically the nature of fascist corruption that the, the Justice Department, starting in 1981 with the Reagan administration, uh, the head of the CIA and the head of the Justice Department put in Executive Order 12333 that said, as long as they, Reagan signed it, as long as the head of the Justice Department and the head of the CIA agree on it, 
they will not prosecute their own organized criminal activities. Basically, they're an organized criminal operation. And um, that's how they had Iran-Contra. We had, uh, you know, 9-11. We have a pandemic. It, it's gone on from there. Killing, there's a great movie, uh, Everything's a Rich Man's Trick, from JFK to 9-11. But basically, the CIA and the empire, the hidden empire, largely uh, based in the intelligence agencies in collusion with the mafia and the MI6 and the Mossad and really all of the uh, intelligence agencies, KGB, Chinese Communist Party, they're all working together. That's, we know that basically the research proving smoking gun I have is this Inzwa Promise software that was hacked. And um, we know from the guy that made it with, was with the NSA. He asked me, William Hamilton, to send him all the incriminating information I could find uh, about how the Justice Department and the CIA stole it, the Reagan administration, right? They, um, and then they put a back door on it, a Trojan horse. Robert Maxwell of Epstein got it, sold it around the world, including to the KGB who sold it to Osama bin Laden this is how the, it's a the perfect cover-up machine. They could wage 9-11 and blame it on, on Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden. But we know, and so this is what needs to be investigated. Intelligence is about investigation, right? It, that, in America, though, it's about covering up and investigating the wrong things and, you know, the nothing. That's why we have an impeachment focused on which one sold weapons to the other guys, you know, I mean, what, what needs to be impeached is the treason that this, that our government, a criminal state, like you said, uh, kills and, um, you know, they either kill the, the truth or, or at least they can just wipe it out with their algorithms using artificial intelligence. That's why I'm so scared of artificial intelligence, but, you know, uh, it's put in the wrong hands. It's it's 1984, right? Um, it's just they make up history. That's why revisionist history is basically there. It's a word, revisionist Zionism. This is why it doesn't make me anti-Semitic. It, it makes it. Which I was thrown off the ballot by the Green Party. Charlie knows he was there. He couldn't defend me because that would be conflict of interest or something. But. Um, Basically, they don't want me there, and but the only reason they could give is that I was anti-Semitic, which is not true. I am anti-Zionist, and that's what what they do to anti-Zionist. Um, that's how you know it's the Zionist stupid, you know, right? And if you look at history, the who killed JFK? There's you know huge number of books on that, and people uh, Daniel Sheehan of the Romero Institute. He's, it's all on YouTube, RomeroInstitute.com, goes through an entire college course out at the Romero Institute in Santa Cruz, where he, he starts with it. Was it Lee Harvey Oswald? Was it the you know, mafia, the CIA? But it, it gets down to it was it was the government, you know, it was the Department of Defense, you know. I mean, it, it is um, an in, an invisible empire, a new world order. And um which has been in place since the end of World War II. It was the agreement between our CIA, this 1947 National Security Act was were, made a deal with Reinhard Gellin, Hitler's head of intelligence against Russia, to, um, to, for the National Security Act that basically created, gave himself the ability to do covert operations, which is basically genocide, torture, uh, for, uh, you know, in Chile and Vietnam and South, you know, everywhere, you know, we've been behind the CIA. You look at a textbook of Central America. I, my method is basically the market research fact checkers. I, you know, first you just think this can't be true. We know, right? If, but why don't we know? So anyhow, you check the facts, look at the history books. The CIA was behind all of the overthrows of all these dirty wars, governments, all South America, Vietnam, you know, everywhere you look, we finance both sides. And, and 
when did we start that? Well, it was with the SS and the OSS formed the CIA. And so this, their plan is to have the Fourth Reich. Jim Mars has written the great book, The Rise of the Fourth Reich. You're seeing that everywhere now. Um, because that that's basically what the investigative journalists, you just research and research, and that's what you find is that, you know, you check any of those facts and it's like, yep. And so some of the best authors, I just wrote this up. I sent it to Charlie and Tim I, and um, I hope they'll, that I want the next time to give a talk and I'm just gonna stick with one book, Defrauding America, a pattern of related scandals. It, might, it's Tim. it makes the Godfather saga pale by comparison, dirty secrets of the CIA and other government operations. Once again, um, you know, Rodney Stitch, yeah, tonight, he was a, an insider. He was, he flew the airplanes to the October yeah, surprise where Bush and, and uh, Casey, uh, you know, agreed to keep the, right, the um, hostages uh, so that Jimmy Carter would lose the election and Ronald Reagan would come in. But, you know, so he and Barry Seal and, and all the people that disappeared suddenly, the evidence is here. That's the thing. We have it. Okay. It's, um, you know, so, uh, but, and then the last thing that has to be covered here is, I want to get this to everyone, this document, 1948, Jews, Jewish atrocities in the homeland, talking about the bio, the plan to massacre women and children. This was the Jewish Zionist plan okay. and, and also to put in bio warfare labs so that the diseases would grow in Palestine. This does not make me anti-Semitic. This is what all Jewish people need to know is that Israel is the anti-Semitic country. They're Nazis. And we need to we need to get the truth out okay. about it. All right. Next three butter, please. I had to say that book is 30 years old and the author is dead. Okay. It's not relevant. It. I just have a note. I'm not gonna rebut Jonathan. I have to rebut what Charlie says. Sorry for the interruption, but uh, I know the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938 exists, and so therefore, theoretically, the federal minimum wage is supposed to apply to everyone. I'm just here to say that it doesn't. One, because there's no amendment saying that the federal government has the exclusive authority to manage labor or wages. The states or the people still do. Um, an, an example is right now, there's uh, Kansas restaurants where people are getting paid uh, two three dollars an hour something absurd they have like a 5 15 an hour minimum wage so if there are states that are allowed to set their minimum wage lower than the federal governments and there aren't federal agents going in and arresting kansas restaurant owners making them pay their employees more then i don't think that federal minimum wage does apply to everyone a little while after obama got into office he said we're going to raise the minimum wage to 10 to 50. And he quietly said, or we quietly found out afterwards, oh, he's only talking about federal employees because those, those are the only employees who the federal government has the authority to raise the wages of because those are the only people who the federal government employs. It doesn't have the authority to raise wages of people it doesn't employ in the private sector or employees of uh, state. Absolutely, Chris, that's employment. nonsense. So that's how the law works. <laughs> and no labor works. Laws? the fact that there are people being paid legally in Kansas restaurants, less than the federal minimum wage means that law is hypothetical. That right doesn't exist. It's not being enforced. We need an amendment before that happens. And only about less than half a percent of American workers are affected by minimum wage increases because they only affect federal employees. And Charlie's right that there are plenty of exemptions that employers can file for. When you go look up who does the federal minimum wage apply to, you look up, I looked at dozens of documents, there are dozens and dozens of dozens of exemptions that you can get. There's dozens of ways to get exemptions from having to pay your employee the federal minimum wage. That's the problem. People like Charlie and the Democratic Party, I don't know, I'm not saying Charlie's doing this on purpose, but he's repeating lies that he heard from the Democratic Party. And the problem is that that law is, was not formally passed. It's not federal authority yet. That's why there are people who get legally paid less than the federal minimum wage. Okay. Ernie, That's ridiculous. You're next. Ernie, you're That's next. Completely, right. completely ridiculous. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, we can good. hear you, Ernie. That sounds okay. Jonathan, thank you again for a good talk. Interesting, stimulating. Uh, 
And I think we, I think we kind of know where you stand politically, and it's not over on the right. <laughs> so you made that clear in a future talk. Um, I sympathize a great deal with your anger and your frustration uh, at how our country is doing, how the government is run, how the economy is doing, and so on and so forth. Uh, I differ a little bit on the history of how this came about uh, and uh, on the solution. Uh, we don't have any real choices. That's just the reality of it. It's a political machine everywhere, even, even in very small organizations where there are a few hundred people voting on some kind of a committee. Uh, in many cases, there's, there's a lot of uh, uh, back uh, backstory things taking place. I've, I've witnessed this myself. And of course, on a national level too, to successfully run for office at any level, particularly at a higher level, you have to be a, a, a long-term and a team player to, to work your way in. And at that point, you're indoctrinated and you understand on which side your bread is buttered and, and you kind of end up doing the uh, go along to get along thing. Uh, this is unfortunate, but it's a reality, certainly of our democracy, and I think of, of many, many others as well. So I, I agree, we don't really have a functioning democracy in the sense we wish we did, uh, and many changes are needed. One example, the fair tax. I think we all remember the fair tax from a couple of years ago. Uh, that bill was favored by most people, but it lost, and it lost because Ken Griffin's uh, tens of millions of dollars, uh, the the richest man in Illinois who was against it versus J.B. Pritzker's tens of millions who was in favor of it. Uh, J.B. attempted to inform people what this was and, and why it was beneficial and why it was important. Uh, whereas Ken Griffin simply uh, went with fear. He said, you're, they're, they're going to come after you right now. They're coming up after hiring some people sooner or later. They're going to come after you. People believe that. And as a result, the fair tax which we really needed, did not pass. Um, there are, are some things that we can do uh, to improve the situation. Fi uh, campaign finance reform would be the one of us. Take money almost totally out of politics would be good. Uh, term limits, I think term limits would be a good idea. Uh, so people would attempt to do good in the short term because they're only gonna be there for a, a reasonable, reasonably short length of time. Uh, rank choice voting might help. Uh, eliminating the electoral college might help. There are a lot of uh, small solutions like that. Uh, a bigger solution is having a parliamentary system as they have in most of the industrialized world. Uh, that seems to be, uh, to, they, they have their problems too, obviously every country does, but uh, it would seem to uh, make, think, make the will of the people a little closer to what the government uh, ends up doing. Uh, there was also talk that uh, uh, there's a lot of apathy. The voice, people's voices aren't heard. I think in a lot of cases, people's voices aren't heard because they choose not to, to raise them. They choose not to get involved. They are apathetic because they are very frustrated with the system and they don't believe it's really going to help very much. And uh, so I am also looking for solutions here uh, I don't put as much faith in democracy as I would in a government that actually delivered some of those uh, good things that you talked about, a fair place to live, a good job, et cetera, et cetera. Those, I think, are more important than how, how we get them. Uh, the problem with any system other than democracy is, is if you have a fair leader who, is, who is, has more dictatorial powers, and frankly, most of our leaders have some dictatorial powers, on a day-to-day -day basis, even though they're elected. Uh, even in the United States, I'm not even talking about Hungary and, and India and, and the Philippines and some of these countries that have elections, but not much of a democracy. Um, the thing of it is, if once you get a leader in, whether it's by vote or by some other method, uh, sometimes it's very hard to get them out. And uh, if we can figure out a way to get people out more quickly, uh, that might help. Thank you very much. Okay. I'm going to do a short rebuttal now. Term limits is nuts. Huh? Term limits are nuts. 
All right. Well, anyway, you know, there's a good passage in James 4, verse 1. I'm going to read from the uh, MSG edition of the Bible here. Where do you think all these, these appalling wars and quarrels come from? Do you think they just happen? Think again. They come about because you fight your own way and fight for it deep inside yourselves. You lust for what you don't have and are willing to kill to get it. You want what is yours and will risk violence to get your hands on it. You wouldn't think of just asking God for it, would you? And why not? Because you know you'd be asking for what you have no right to. Your spoiled children, each wanting their own way. In a sense, what's really happening is we, mankind has a problem. And that problem is it's his own selfish desires inside. Each of us wants power. Each of us wants money. And in the old-fashioned Christian religion, it's called sin. You know, we have the Ten Commandments. We have this. But every one of us has the potential to do good or evil in our own members. And we must remember that. You know, men are men. And there's still going to be sinful natures in that men. I have found myself the redemptive power of Christ to really help solve that down as a matter of fact for me it that the very thing i do i hate that what i do therefore it is not it is not i who do it but the sin that dwelleth in me and what that simply means is if you have a god in behind you and you accept jesus into your heart i think you'd be much better off and that would be a good way to solve a lot of our wars but you got to remember that uh mankind has been each and every one of us goes our own way each and every one of us has what we don't want. We covet thy neighbor's wife. We covet thy neighbor's goods. We bear false witness. Many things. Perhaps maybe we should start learning again about things like the Ten Commandments and just common decency. That's all I'm going to say on this matter. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. All right. You want to rebut? Go ahead. <laughs> first off we're not a democracy we're a republic and second when you look at Reagan we need much of the things that Reagan is about as he said the non-deadliest words in the English language I'm from the government and I'm here to help <laughs> <laughs> all right Anybody else have a rebuttal tonight? Yeah. Go ahead and uh, 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 do we? Do you mind if you want? Does anybody mind me going a second time, real quick? Yeah. <laughs> I'll we'll give you three minutes. Just make it quick because then we're going to get Jonathan up to. Uh, all right, Charlie. I know you want to do a second one. Lee, we'll do Charlie, then we'll do. Uh, we'll do uh, Jonathan at the end. Okay. Make it quickly. The Republican Supreme Court. In 1971, Lewis Powell said, missed opportunities in the court. And in 1980, the Republicans controlled the majority for the last 50 years. And boy, did they take that opportunity to the bank. If you look at every case, you read the uh, arguments, fraud, 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 fraud. Let me give you one pre-clearance. We used to have a Voting Rights Act that said, you Republican states keep suppressing the black vote. So anytime you pass a voting law, it goes to the Department of Justice. If they think it's suppression of the black vote, they'll just sit on it. You won't be able to enforce it. So then um, Roberts got up and he said, you know, we don't have that voter suppression anymore. Those Republicans, they don't do it anymore. So we're going to throw that away. No more of it. Um, Ginsburg said, I'm sorry, I'm too fast. Make it quick. Okay. Uh, Ginsburg said, you know what? That's like you're standing in a downpour with a, an umbrella over your head and you're not getting wet. So you say, well, I don't need this umbrella for Christ's sake. You throw it away. Boy, what happened? And you know what happened when they threw away the clearance? Texas, on the same day, passed the voting suppression law. <laughs> Congratulations. Okay, uh, Charlie, you want to say something? Go ahead. All right, I just want to say that 
term limits is the biggest product of nonsense that's ever been perpetrated. Now, apparently, the labor laws of the United States and every union contract recognizes years of credible service as something that's beneficial and ensures job security for the person, the employee. Now, you want to come along. Let's say you have 10, 100 employees in Congress. You want to get rid of 10 very qualified, hardworking people and replace them with 100 possible nincompoops, loonies. And you have to, this term limits would never go and be approved in a private sector. Employers don't get rid of people who do their work. And do it every day without issue. You have to have just cause to get terminate employment. Not simply be, this is ridiculous. An employee does good work for many, many years and you get rid of them. That's ridiculous. Thank you. All right, Karina, you want to rebut? Go ahead. Don't turn me with these dictators. Uh, employment in the United States is employment at will. You can get fired anytime for almost any reason. Uh, corporations are having massive round, la rounds of layoffs now, and they're not just laying off a bunch of losers and slackers. Uh, good people, dedicated people get laid off. Uh, and people who do less work with more political skill keep their jobs. Uh, it, uh, I've I've seen and I've experienced being a, a good employee uh, who gets whose whose position is eliminated and and corporations uh, love to shrink uh, jobs uh, love to eliminate jobs. Uh, I am a, a computer application developer. I get paid to automate things and to. Uh, try to eliminate as many manual steps as possible uh, from business processes. Uh, so um, uh, another thing I want to say is that you can create as many third parties as possible and have a hundred million different third parties. But if we're still in a duopoly, we're still in a duopoly. So we need to focus on systemic changes first because the Republicans and the Democrats are very, very comfortable where they are. Um, and a third thing I want to say is, Ellen, you keep conflagrating Jews and Zionism, and that does appear to be anti-Semitic. And you and people have sent you emails saying that there are Jews who are anti-Zionist, but you keep using the word Jewish instead of Zionist. Uh, there's Orthodox Jews that protest Israel that that were against the formation of Israel. So. That's all I have to say. Were you employed in a union shop? Okay. All right. Uh, Karina, is that it? Yes. All right. Jonathan, you get your final remarks. You got about maybe four or five minutes tops. Four or five minutes. My goodness. Well, the thing is, it's 737. You want to get out of here by 745. So uh, speak away. And... Uh, Let's just keep it within six, five or six minutes, okay? So make your points succinct, and uh, you know what I'm saying. And I appreciate everybody coming tonight. So Jonathan, go speak away. Thank you for your comments, and thank you for being here, and thank you for participating in Zoom. Uh, I do appreciate it. Uh, thank you to everyone who uh, provided me support in transportation, or uh, encouraging me on my research for this topic. Uh, you're all uh, absolute mentions for being here today, either in person or on the Zoomiverse. Some helpful articles to read on this subject are, this chart shows how Reaganomics has destroyed the middle class by Wes Williams. Uh, how the heck did our politics get here? Chicago historian Rick Perlstein's fourth book, Reaganland by Christopher Borelli and get the book by Rick Perlstein, Reaganland. He has four, uh, The Invisible Bridge, Nixon Land, uh, Before the Storm and Reaganland. They uh, 
tell you how we got here basically in a very entertaining and uh, accurate historical uh, account. It's time for a new contract with America by Roger Hall. What Reagan has done to America by William Grider. Election 2024 dealing with devils by Michael Alpert. America is not a democracy by David Dayen. Uh, Age of Reaganism by Andrew Kopkind. Age of Predation by Thomas Meany. Ronnie and Nancy by Gore Vidal. Uh, I suggest a four part documentary that was uh, released from Showtime in 2020 called The Reagans. And uh, there's an interview from uh, 1985 where Helen Thomas interviews Ronald Reagan on YouTube, which uh, I highly suggest. Uh, envision a system which causes dysfunction, suffering, oppression, destruction, chaos, and misery, which is based on authoritarianism, classism, imperialism, militarism, oligarchy, colonialism, propaganda, censorship, corruption, sham elections, xenophobia, demonizing of artists and journalists and organizers and of greed and what system that currently exists on earth would that most resemble? Uh, don't donate money to the duopoly parties. Uh, don't vote for the duopoly parties. And if you feel like you have to vote for the duopoly parties, uh, think strategically. If you're in a safe state, uh, and you've never voted for the candidate who you view to be the lesser of two evils, uh, vote for a third party or in the right in space, no confidence vote. If you're in a swing state, please don't let the orange haired clown back in. Uh, Even if we have to vote for Biden? Well, strategically, we have to eliminate both parties if they're going to let us eliminate one of those two parties through their own system, if they're going to help us get rid of Trump, awesome. And then we'll peacefully and democratically mass mobilize to deal with whoever still wants to do the same things as Trump, just not be orange haired clown doing it. Uh, no one's neighbors be engaged with civil society groups and local grassroots organizations. Uh, don't support the debates that exclude third party candidates. Watch and listen and read non-corporate media outlets and independent viewer listener supported journalism and uh, independent published uh, media by local non-profit or organizations. Host third party candidates, house meetings, speaking events and debate watching parties. Support local workers, peace, human rights and self-determination movements. Study the history of class struggle donate food, clothing, and supplies to mutual aid groups, refuse to give any support to or recognize any legitimacy in the wealth, power, and influence of those who continue business as usual, build solidarity, and cultivate what I like to call uh, we deas. Uh, Frederick Douglass once said the limits of tyrants are prescribed by the endurance of those whom they oppress. So one more time, I'm gonna put on my uh, They Live. John Carpenter has a great movie called They Live. So I'm gonna put on my John Carpenter uh, They Live glasses. Uh, we the people of earth have come here to chew bubble gum and oust the ruling class from power and we're all out of bubble gum. So in uh, memory of Slim Brundage, the founder of the College of Complexes, I say, Go in peace, serve justice. Uh, thanks be to Slim Brundage, the janitor, as he's affectionately known. And uh, thank you so much for each and every day wearing your They Live glasses to see what the ruling class are really doing to our planet. And the sleeping giant is about to wake up. I'll see you all at the We the People Evolution. <laughs> And with that, the uh, College of Complexes is officially adjourned.
thank all of you for coming tonight. I really appreciate the good turnout we had at the restaurant here tonight and on Zoom. Again, we'll see all of you next week. We are now officially adjourned. All right.